Amen, amen. Um, I don't think Evangelist Poole is on, so I'm going to ask Evangelist Catherine Simmons if she will uh, do our prayer for us this evening. Evangelist Simmons, there she goes. Gotcha. I had to unmute myself. <laughs> Praise him. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Jesus. In your precious name, we come thanking you and praising you, glorifying you. You are our all in all. You know what each and every one of us need. You know what each and every one of us would have asked for. If I had remembered to ask if anyone needed prayer, you know all of that, Jesus. It doesn't matter what we as human beings forget to do or say you take care of all of it all you do everything that we need and even more than we could think to ask for we praise you for that and we thank you in advance for all of the healing all of the strengthening all of the providing mm. that you do for us and for everyone else, Jesus, we ask that you touch our mm. president. Mm. We ask that you touch each and every one of the senators, each and every one of the people in the House of Representatives, all of our governing bodies, Jesus. We all need them to be the best they can possibly be. And we ask that you guide them in that direction. We ask also that you continue to be with those who are in the hospitals and jail and confined in any way that they choose not to be confined. We thank you in advance for that, Jesus, and we thank you for all that you're doing for us tonight, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I say this in your precious name, in your glorious name, in your matchless name, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Praise God for Sister Evangelist Simmons in our prayer this evening. At this time, we're going to have our scripture read by Evangelist Gloria Marie Austin Price from Alabama State Council. Psalms 27, 1 through 14, Evangelist Price. Amen. Evangelist Gloria Marie Price, are you available? All right. We're going to uh, go ahead and read the scripture. I'll just go ahead and read it for her. 
The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he, has, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Oh, hear, O oh Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou settest, seek my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me, put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because, my, because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait of the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers and hearers of his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I play. I was sitting there reading that. I just wanted to jump out of my chair and just holler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that word was just feeling so good to me. Um, when I think of the goodness of the Lord and how great he is in my life, I just want to scream and holler sometimes and just jump. Bless so, you. yes, amen. I, I just feel his presence just right now. At this time, I'm going to introduce to some and present to the rest of us our teacher for the hour, none other than our very own Bishop Rufus Sanders, the pastor of Emmanuel Temple Church, Apostolic Faith. Bishop Sanders, give the Lord a hand, praise as he comes. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Everybody, praise, praise the, the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank the Lord. I thought I had touched a, a button or something for a moment there. But we give God praise and we honor him for another Tuesday night Bible class that we have been able to gather ourselves together. We uh, want to thank God for you who are on uh, line thus far. And we hope and pray and wait on others to come in. But we want to pray for the sick, uh, the trustee Irwin continually. Uh, we want to pray for the Davises, the Pickens. We want to pray a special prayer for uh, uh, the Pentecostal Church of Christ in Cleveland, Ohio, where late Bishop Jesse Ellis pastor for a uh, low many years, as the Lord would strengthen them as they prepare to bury him on the weekend. Uh, we want to also pray for the people who are coming to church. We've had a uh, last few weeks, a, a host of visitors. I want us to remember the family of Deacon David Jones. They have been really faithful. Uh, and uh, we wanted to pray for them. Also, Mr. Van Williams, who has been coming to the church. Let's pray for him that the Lord will deal with him and talk to him as well. And others, people that's in the hospital, people that are sick that I don't even know they're sick, request I have never heard, I haven't heard, I know the Lord is able, and y'all know he's able too, and you know he can do anything but fail, and our prayers are such. 
I want to uh, give the announcement very quickly. We are in the months of prayer. I want to thank those saints who have been coming throughout the day uh, for prayer. I've seen the list today. They had a, a really nice list of saints who came during the lunch hour, uh, and we praise the Lord for that. But uh, we want the saints to sign up. If you have not made your way to church for the prayer, you need to do that. Six o'clock it's open, and then it's open all day long. You can come leave your prayer in the uh, sanctuary. Uh, you can sit wherever you want to. You don't have to be disturbed by anybody else. We practice social distancing. Uh, you can stay as long as you want to. You can meditate. You can read your Bible. But leave your prayer in the church. And we're praying for so many things. And primarily, we're praying that the Lord will bless this church, bless this work, save somebody, baptize somebody, even in the midst of this pandemic. And even in the midst of the prayer, give God some praise and thank him for what he's doing for you. Things could be much, much, much worse. Pray for this country. My God, we haven't seen times like these in which we live ever in the history of the United States of America. This election is coming up, and we're praying that God holds this country together and is not destroyed in the midst of this election. Which brings me to the point, if you have not registered to vote, do it, do it. it. This election is consequential. It is one of the most important elections in the history of this country. Uh, and you can see now from all of the fighting in-house between the Senate and the House of Representatives and the President and the, those who are running uh, Mr. Biden against Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump against Mr. Biden. It goes on and on and on, but we need to vote. And you need to look at the policies. You need to see what it is that you're voting for. You don't want to vote just because uh, the party that you belong to. See what the policies and the issues are. See what the issues are. One of the biggest things that's facing, facing this country now is that probably unless the Lord intervenes or unless we find some votes real quick, they're getting ready to do away with Obamacare, which has given millions and millions of people insurance. I don't know if you're on Obamacare or not. But that's why you got to vote, because they're getting ready to vote against uh, Obamacare and end it. Uh, and probably that's what's going to happen. And if that happened, we really are going to see some major upheaval in this United States of America. So pray for the country. Pray for the government. Pray for the issues. Vote. Get you somebody to talk to and to vote. I'm told that uh, uh, Dr. Keyes here at our church, he works with the Board of Elections. He can give you any information that you need in regards to how do I register, where do I vote at, when do I vote. A vote is not until uh, November, but you can register. My understanding is that uh, uh, a voting for uh, uh, will start, for people who vote early, will start in October. And of course, some have started across the country voting early through mail. However you do it, whatever is your custom, you go ahead and do it and make sure that uh, you are taking care of your civic responsibility. All right, tonight we're going to go into the Bible study and we're talking about the lying and deception. Uh, and the saints respond to lying and deception. Uh, why would we have a Bible class like this? Well, we're saints of God. We need to always know what it is that we believe. We need to always know what it is that we respond to and how to respond to. And then some of us might be dealing with lying and deception. How do I get out of this? How, how do I raise myself out of being in such a terrible situation? Uh, here is the, uh, the listing here, lying and deceit. What does the Bible teach us? And if Brother Kevin, if you just hold it right there, let me make some statements, and then I'll tell you when to move to this first slide here. Uh, a liar in the Bible, the Bible gives two primary major scriptures against the whole thing of lying. A liar, it says in Psalms 101 and 7, cannot tarry in his sight. And the scripture reads, he that uh, would deceive shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. So here we see that lying is of such import 
to the Lord that he makes it very clear that a person who lies will have a very, very difficult time tearing in the sight of the Lord. Uh, and he almost says nothing like this in regards to many, many, many other sins. So it tells you how lying is major to the Lord. Uh, then he says in Revelation 21 and 8, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. He lists a whole list of uh, elements. He says vile people, murderers, sexually immoral people, idolatries. And then he says all liars. Now, obviously, all have sinned, all have lied, and have come short of the glory of God at one time or another. But what the Lord wants us to do, especially us who have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, is to break the pattern, break the pattern. And I've listed some ways that the pattern can be broken before we go into the, the major portion of the Bible class. Uh, Examine the things that triggers in you the need to tell an untruth. Uh, is it something that makes you feel better if you tell an untruth, if you lie? Uh, is it something you do to impress others? Because that's a lot of time people lie because they're trying to impress people. Uh, is it uh, you do it because you want to hurt somebody? A lot of times people will not tell the truth. They will lie because they're trying to hurt somebody. But it's incumbent upon you to think mm -hmm. before you speak so that, that that you speak when you speak comes from truth. Everything that happens from us, our emotion, our speech, our re response to actions against us, it emanates from our heart. If your heart is not pure, blessed is the pure in heart, for they shall see God. If your heart, which is the seat of your emotions, is not pure, then what emanates from an unpure, unclean, vile heart are things like lying and deceit. So when the Lord saves us and fills us with the Holy Ghost, what he does is changes our hearts so he can get to the root of your feeling, get to the root of that reservoir where the things that we do come from. Set some boundaries for yourself. What you talk about, everything you talk about not, might not be holy, it might give itself to lying and to other things. So, so every situation that you're not sure of, why jump into it? Accusations, assumptions, because if you move on assumptions and accusations, if you're not careful, you might end up lying or actually deceiving. Think before you speak. Uh, put in your mind exactly what it is that you must say or you got to say before uh, you say it. Uh, some responses when you don't know what to say, rather than saying the things that would lead to lying or lead to deception, you could say, I'm not sure. You could easily say, I really don't know. You can say, I didn't hear. If you didn't hear, you, know, you don't want to say I didn't hear and you did hear. Or you can say, uh, I'm not really interested in involving myself in that conversation. But there's ways you can stop lying. Now let me go through the types of lying as we get ready to go into the major uh, bulk of this lesson. Lying is really a complex kind of behavior. These are the types of lies. White lies, white lies are supposed to be those lies that's not uh, that harmful. But every lie is harmful. The Lord, the Lord said again, a lie shall not tear in my sight. And the reason being because the Lord can't trust a lie. You can't trust a lie. Lies of omission. Sometimes people don't tell a lie verbally, but they don't tell the truth. And by not telling the truth, inadvertently, they're lying. So it's called a lie of omission, all right? Uh, sometimes exaggeration. When we over-exaggerate situations, we have to be careful as children of God to make sure that we're not sending the wrong message, which could be a lie. Then there's this thing called gray lies, these subtle kind of lies, where we 
language it such until it don't come out as a white lie or a black lie, but we cover it, say, in a joke, or we use a, a humor to disguise it, but it still could be a lie. Uh, and then there's the complete untruth, when somebody just bold-faced lie. There's this thing called pathological compulsive lying, where people lie all the time when we realize that they have a problem. And there's some people who actually have a problem. And it's, it's an addictive kind of problem dealing with a compulsivity and dealing with pathology, which might mean that you need some real help. Uh, because uh, again, this stuff emanates from your heart. Uh, and if you talk about the biology of it, get the, it get mixed up in who you are, how you grew, how you develop, and where this stuff come from. But the Lord said, Elias shall not tarry in my sight. He said that clearly, and he means it. Honesty is always the best policy. Lies tend to linger, uh, and they tend to come back to hunt you. When you tell an untruth, what happens? Uh, depending upon what that untruth is, the nature of the untruth, it will come back to hunt you. And that's what the Lord is concerned about with us. Some of our lives get so tangled up because of a lie we told. Some of our lives get so combusted, to, to combusted together because we didn't tell the truth. Again, let me go back to some things you can say when you don't want to get caught on the line. It's really, somebody asks you something, you might need to say, I'd rather not say. Uh, rather than get yourself involved in a conversation. Or you can say, I really don't know. Uh, or you can say, uh, I don't know for sure. If you don't know for sure, why give your opinion or your comment or you, your opinionated about something that you don't know for sure? Somebody's asking you something and you don't know for sure, why lie? Why act as if you do know when you don't know? Uh, you can say, I only heard, but I don't know. If you have not been privy to something and you was not there, you didn't see, you need to make that very clear. I don't know because I wasn't there and I didn't see. You might need to add, I heard, but I don't know. But many times we get caught up in lying situations because we're so frightened not to just say, I don't. We want people to think that we do know. Or we, want think, we want people to think that we are privy to. Then you can tell them, hey, why don't you go ask them? You know, because if you say that, people will leave, eventually leave you alone because they know you're not the kind of person to get pulled into stuff. Uh, and this, this lying can be a spirit. Not only can it be pathological and, and it can be compulsive, it can just be a demonic spirit that comes over. Uh, you where you end up lying. Lies always come back to hunt us. They linger. And sometimes it gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, I was watching the, the hearings or the pre-hearings for the, the uh, Supreme Court justices that they're, that they're trying to pick and put in place before the election. And uh, what television, what technology has done, almost everything that these people said it is taped somewhere. Well, now all of the people who are saying that this lady, that the president is getting ready to submit, that she should be submitted and, uh, because he's the president and he's got this final say. But these same people, when President Obama, and I'm quite sure you follow the news, you aware of this, when he tried to do the same thing that Mr. Trump is trying to do right now, they're saying that they didn't say that. They didn't say, they, they, they're saying that they didn't let President Obama do it because he was going to be out of office. And they're saying that now it's okay. And the people saying, you're lying. You did try to, to stop President Obama. You did. They said, no, we didn't. They got tapes of uh, Mr. Lindsey Graham. They got tapes of uh, 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 Mr. Grassley. They got tapes of just about every major congressman who stopped Obama, but now who's permitting Mr. Trump to do the same thing, because now they're lying. Lies linger. 
That was four years ago, and now the lies have caught up with it. They linger. Lies have consequences. Listen, another element of, of people who lie, you always got to consider the source of whoever it is or whatever is being asked of you uh, and ask of your opinion and ask for your input so that you don't get yourself caught up in something that is terrible later on. Lying causes people to be punished unjustly. Lying causes people to be judged by others unjustly. You're a human being. I know by now you have probably been lied on and you have been misjudged because of the lie that was told on you and there's nothing more hurtful than somebody to point blank boldly lie on you when you know that is not true. That's why the Lord preaches to the church in the New Testament and he starts out in the Old Testament by saying in the Ten Commandments about bearing false witness against thy neighbor. Uh, lying can generally erode trust in a whole society. Psalms 15, 2 through 3 talks about the things that God requires out of us. He says, I want you to be blameless. I want you to be righteous. And I want you to speak truth from your heart. And he said, I want your tongue to have no slander. In other words, you don't want us to lie and destroy each other and destroy ourselves, and destroy our reputations. There are seven things that are an abomination to God. Two of them involve lying. He says in Proverbs 16 through 19, a lying tongue and a false witness that tell lies, God hates a lying tongue. God hates a liar primarily because he can't trust a liar. Uh, you can't trust a liar. Uh, when people lie to you, and they lie two and three times, you develop a mistrust for them. You don't know, you really don't know what they believe. You don't know what to receive. Uh, you, you, it almost frightens you and you develop a sense of paranoia. Uh, you know, and, and so that's another reason why saints of God should not be in a situation where they lie because people will lose respect for them and then people will never believe them. It's like the boy, uh, who kept hollering wolf. He kept hollering wolf, and every time he hollered wolf, the people would run, and they hide, and they got scared. Well, the wolf wasn't coming. What he enjoyed was seeing them run. Finally, the wolf shows up one day, but he had lied so long until the people decided that they were not going to run because he lied. He's lying. Ain't no wolf coming. Well, Unfortunately, it was the day the wolf came. And I can imagine many of them was completely destroyed, killed, ran themselves to death because of this little boy's lie. Next slide, Brother Kevin. Definitions. First John 2.21, no lie is untrue, it is a falsehood. All lies are falsehood. Even when you unintentionally lie, and we'll talk about that later, it's a falsehood. But it's very natural to lie. It's very natural for you to get yourself caught up in a falsehood. A lie is a false statement made with deliberate, here is the correct definition right here. It's a false statement made with the deliberate intent to deceive. When you lie, you are deliberately trying to deceive somebody and trying to move somebody from truth when you lie. That's what a lie is. That's why it's so hurtful, because you're trying to make somebody receive something that is totally true that could hurt them, that could destroy them. One of the sins that the Lord listed in that New Testament that he hates, I go back to the scriptures, he said, a liar will not even tear my sight. You know what that means? I mean, he's not going to even give you a, a chance to explain yourself, because he knows if a lie liar have not confessed and repented that he'll just keep right on lying and a lie you cannot believe and so it's when you deliberately on purpose intent to deceive to deceive mean to make somebody think something that's not so 
and you have not even given thoughts to the ramifications or the consequences of being in that kind of situation. Next uh, slide, Brother Kevin. Deceit is an act or practice intended to mislead by a false appearance or a statement. Because sometimes people don't understand deceit and lies about the same thing. But deceit deals with the practice intended to mislead by false appearance. Deceit might deal more with the impression that you put out there and what people actually see. And it's being created to give people the false impression of what's really there, of what's really going on. It's called deceit. The difference is generally spoken, but deceit includes anything, whether words or deeds. Because sometimes you can act a certain way that's a lie. You ever see somebody act like they're happy as they can be, but they're not, they angry as they can be? Well, actually, they're perpetrating a lie. They are intended to lead people to believe what is not. Uh, you, you've seen people who treat you like you're their best friend, or you treat somebody like, boy, I really love this person, they're my best friend, and you really don't. That's deception. You're making somebody think something that's not so. You're not telling them the truth. You're not being truthful with them. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go around telling somebody, I like you and I don't like you. I like you. I like... I'm not saying that. I, you know, you got to treat people honestly. You got to treat people, uh, you know, in, in, within the confines of a human relationship. But when you purposely and you deliberately put on a false face to make somebody think something that's not that. People do it all the time, it, it, all the time. This is how they get their way. People will do it, they'll laugh and have fun and be nice to you and then they ask you to give them $10. And the only reason they was nice to you, laugh with you, act like they was your friend was because they wanted something from you. They deliberately, misled you you know you might have misled somebody deliberately because you wanted something from the person you deceived them and in essence you really kind of lied to them and not only did you destroy them but you're actually destroying yourself from the inside out that stuff comes from a heart that has not fully confessed their sins to god and fully repented of god and have not fully allowed the Holy Ghost to lead them to all truth. Now, one thing about lying and deception is that when it happens, you know it. You actually know it. Now, you might not do anything about it. You might even continue the behavior, but you actually know this is not right the way that I'm acting. And not only do you know it, but other people know it too, because all of us being human beings have been trapped in these situations before. And that's what the Holy Ghost comes forward to lead and guide us and pull us out of this stuff to make us the children of God that he wants us to be. Next slide, Brother Kevin. Not everything that is untrue is necessarily a lie to see. I, I needed to say that because sometimes people make mistakes. They say things that is not true, but they did not mean for it to be untrue. What, what could happen? They got faulty information. That's why you have to be very careful when you do get information to make sure the information is correct information. Or if it's not uh, if you're not able to uh, uh, take the information and verify it, you need to then add those uh, uh, prefixes or suffixes, like I said, just saying, I don't know for sure, or this is, I heard this, but I don't know this, so that you don't get yourself in a situation where you're repeating something or you're saying something that is not true. Because once you say it, then you are part of passing the lie on. And you're part of passing the deceit on if you say it without saying, I don't know for sure, or I heard, but I'm not clear. Lying generally involves deliberate falsehood told with intent of misleading or causing someone to believe in that. When you lie, what you got to realize is that you're trying to make somebody else believe something that's not so. As, you know, if a saint acts like this, 
we have a saint that has really serious trouble, really serious trouble. That's why I go back to the scripture that he says, a liar will not tarry in my sight. When you call someone to believe an air or to believe a lie themselves, then it says something about your character. I mean, you tell them a vile. It talks about your vile character and the vile nature of something inside of you that is rotten and has gone completely astray and pulling other people into your pathology and your sin. Next slide, Brother Kevin. Acts 5, 1 through 9 says, find fantastic story in, in the New Testament which explains this so clearly. Ananias and Sapphira was supposedly in the church. The, the, the edict was given by the church. The church had got together and they was trying to buy some land. And they uh, basically said to all the saints, sell all you got and bring it to the church. And then what we will do, we will distribute it among those who are less fortunate than the rest of us. Sounds like a noble idea. Sounds like a great idea. Churches have been doing that kind of thing since the history of the church. We got benevolent in the church. Uh, so churches do that all the time. They feed the poor. They, uh, they try to help the homeless. They they got shelters for uh, single women. They, they we always do that. Ananias and Sapphira, they sold their property, and then what they did, rather than bring the the money and give it to the church like they were supposed to, everybody oh, agreed. To. <laughs> they gave part of it to the church, and then they kept part of it and hid it. And then they went and told the others that they gave all they had. They, when they came to, to give the money, they said, well, we sold ours and this is what we sold ours for, and this is everything. Peter, who was in good graces with the Lord at that time, Peter, he, Peter, he had his ups and his downs, but at that time, he was in pretty good shape. He had discernment, he was able to take a look at the situation. He said, how is it that you have Deceive this thing in your heart. You lie to God. A, a lie, a lie will always be exposed. It might not be exposed immediately. It might not be exposed the way that you want it to be exposed. But the problem with a lie is that it can't keep its mouth shut. A, a lie exposes itself. And this lie was exposed and said, uh, Ananias and Sapphira become an example of what it is, the consequences of what happened to somebody lie. And not only did they lie, they lied to God. And we lie to God so many times by making false promises that we don't keep, simply because we don't understand how devastating it is when we lie to God, to the Holy Ghost, and even to our brother and our sister. Next slide, uh, Brother Kevin. Lies come from the heart. They come from something when a person lies and when they lie consistently and when the lying is compulsively and when the lying is pathologically, that means something rooted deep down inside that person's heart that's causing this. Of course, the root cause is sin, but there's a lot of saints who get caught up in lying and you got to want, and they're still in the church. They, they like the five uh, uh, virgins who never left the church. They just ran out of oil. They ran out of oil, but they didn't know they needed the oil to go to the next step. They ran out of oil, but they was in the church. The Bible says they was all part of the bridegroom. They was part of the, the wedding party, rather. But a lie comes from something rooted in the heart. Something has gone desperately wrong. Something has not been resolved or solved. Uh, maybe when you got the Holy Ghost, or maybe somewhere with your walk with the Lord that you find yourself uh, going back into some of the old habits. But the Lord want all this stuff cut out of our hearts. Uh, it maybe it's got to do with your personality development. Maybe it's got to do with your meanness. Maybe it's got to do with your feeling of inferiority, your feeling of low esteem. But it, it takes root down in the heart and then it comes out. It's a, a, a petrifying smell. It causes when it comes out. Because out of the heart comes anger and the lying and the hatred and the gossip and, and the, uh, the other treacherous behavior that we 
sometimes perpetrate on the saints of God and on other individuals. Uh, it's, a, it's a sad thing when saints can't get along because of these kinds of things. It's a sad thing when saints mistreat each other. This is the Bible class tonight. Now, that's what this is. Tuesday night is a Bible class night. When saints can't treat each other with the love and the respect and the care that we should. And if we can't do it with each other, we definitely can't do it with the world. Next slide, Brother Kevin. There are outright false falsehoods. I'm going to get into the specific kinds of lies in the scene. There's outright falsehood. There's bold-faced lie. That's outright. There's that black lie, which usually have serious consequences. Sometimes lying can get you in really serious trouble that nobody can get you out of. Then the little white lies. These are the ones that's supposedly not that serious. The one, oh, I was just kidding. I was just playing. Uh, you can't play with a lie. You cannot play with a lie. It'll take root. I go back to that hard stuff. It'll take root inside of you, and before you know it, it'll become commonplace, and you'll find yourself already. I know you're saying, and I, I, as I talk more about this, I'm, I'm asking myself, how can a saint lie? But it's a very human reaction that comes from our hearts that have not been totally cleansed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Bring me to David. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit. Because David, who loved the Lord probably more than anybody else I know of in that Bible, the Lord said he was the apple of his eye. David had gotten to the point where he actually killed the man and lied about it. That's how ugly lying is. Lying makes you cover up stuff. And when stuff gets covered up, that means that it's not repentant, not confessed, which means you are in serious trouble. You're in serious trouble because if you don't get the stuff out, it then will almost like a cancer spread through your body and destroy the rest of your body. And it can start with something really, really, really small. So it's like being angry with somebody. If you don't, if you don't get that thing out and let and allow that thing to fester and to grow in you, you end up hating. You end up being against your brother and your sister simply because you didn't take care of it. So these little white lies start out as little lies, don't mean nothing. If they aren't brought into check, they turn into serious behavior uh, defects, which, is, which affects your spirituality and your growth in the Lord. Next slide, Brother Kevin. Lying is a moral wrong. People who tell lies will often become very upset when other people lie to them and can be the quickest to accuse others of lying. Now, how you know about lying so well? Because it's something that we do from the day that we're born. Shaping iniquity, the Bible says, born in sin, that stuff is in it. Uh, Sunday school lesson Sunday, we brought up the issue about little kids. Uh, you don't have to teach them how to lie or to deceive. They almost know how to do it when they get here. If you ever watch a baby or a young child, they just know how to do it. Uh, they know how to deceive, they know how to hide things. They know how <laughs> to tell little stories. It's human nature. And this is one reason why the Lord came to save us, to, to, to stop the, the destruction that comes with us when we're brought into this world. Sad thing about it, some of us go our whole life caught up in the, the situation and never change. Or, because another thing that happens, if it's not taken care of, like a kid, they learn how to get very good at it. Now, there's some people who can lie to you, and when they're lying to you, you fall under their spell and you believe them. Many, many, many of women have believed many, many men who are the best liars in the world. And when the woman finally comes to herself, the man has stripped her of everything she got, and he's gone about her business, and the woman is left there with nothing because she believed the lie. And we could go into male gender personality differences, and we can maybe answer some of the questions of why that is. But my, my uh, issue here tonight is that lying is a moral wrong. When you lie, you have committed a grave moral sin. 
you committed a great moral sin. Next slide. Brother Kevin, next slide. Okay. False promise. When people make promises, they have no intention of keeping or no, they cannot keep. This is a form of deliberately misleading people. Two things in this slide. When people make promise that they have no, when you do or say something and you have no intention and you know you don't have any intention of keeping or bringing it through, then you have lied to the person. Now, and I understand that maybe you, you know, you, with you, somebody wants you to stop by tomorrow, okay? So you tell them yes. Deep down inside of you, know, I can't stop by tomorrow, but you tell them yes for any number of reasons. You, you don't want to hurt them. Uh, you tell them yes because you just want them to stop asking you. But you have lied. When tomorrow coming, you don't show. You lied because you knew yesterday that you weren't coming when you said you was coming. When the easiest thing to say, I can't come, or I don't want to come, or whatever. But to give somebody the impression that you're going to do something that you know you're not going to do is a lie. It's a form of this of deliberately misleading. And that's what the Lord don't like for us to do. He wanna because it leads to so many other things. If you can't do, don't say you're going to do. Now you might need to say, I'll try to, or give me some time to think about it, or let me call you. And then the thing is, if you make a promise and something comes up between the time that the promise got to be executed, you got plenty enough time to call the person and say, I can't come, I changed my mind, whatever, whatever. But to not do anything to rectify the situation, you have allowed the lie to take root and to come to fruition. Now everybody understand that everybody makes mistakes from time to time and I just and you and I I can say you yeah, I just couldn't get there and you say well I understand you couldn't get there. But the, the the pressure is on me. Could I not get there or did I know that I wasn't gonna come in the first place? And you might not never know I even lied. You just thought, well, he couldn't get there. But God knows, I know what was in my heart when I made that promise, when I said it. Did I mean it or did I know up front that I wasn't going to do this? Next slide, bro, Kevin. The story of Jacob, Laban, Rachel, and Leah is an excellent example in the uh, Old Testament. Jacob, who was a deceiver, which you all know, and he suffered severe consequences. Uh, him and his mother was the one who stole Esau's birthright. Uh, he deceived his father, Isaac, along with the help of his mother, got that boy's birthright. And then when he left, went to find him a wife, his uncle, uh, deceived him, he ended up with a woman he didn't love and had to work for one he did love for seven years. When you lie, the lie in you continues and you become a victim yourself because what goes around usually comes around. If you lie, somebody gonna lie on you. If you deceive, Somebody is going to eventually deceive you. And there's nothing more painful, I said earlier, than to be deceived and to be lied to. It hurts so bad. Ask, ask anybody who is a lover, two lovers. There's nothing to hurt them more than deception and lying. They'll cry all night long because somebody lied. How could she lie to me like that? No matter what else don't happen, that's not the issue no more. It's the lying that becomes the issue. How could he lie to me like that? Pharaoh deceived Moses by promising I'm gonna let Israel go. Every time Pharaoh went, Moses went to Pharaoh, can we go, can we go? Yeah, y'all can go. Every time they took off, they took off behind. Stopped them. Uh, the Lord plagued them. 
And every time Moses would pray that the Lord release the plague, they lie again. Until finally, the Lord told Moses, just get the people and get on out of here. Pharaoh took off behind Moses. That's how they got drowned in the Red Sea. It was because they had lied continuously against the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel finally just finally said, we're not taking these lies no more, he broke away. The Pharaoh and his army got drowned in the Red Sea. As humans, there may be circumstances beyond our control when we simply cannot keep a promise. We really intended to keep it. It willingly promises what we know we can't do. We, we might not keep a promise, but then there's ways out, as I said earlier. You know, you, you have to find a way to let the individual know or the person or the situation is that something else came up. I couldn't get in touch with you, but God knows the contents of your heart. God knows that heart. He knows the heart. And no matter what we say or how we act, he knows what was in your heart in the first place to do. Uh, the next slide, Brother Kevin. We're almost there tonight, son. You're doing very good. Flattery is another form of lying and deceit. When people want to make a favorable impression on others, saying nice things, that they don't really mean. There's a scripture in the Bible that says we don't want to hear smooth words. We don't want to hear hard and true. We want some smooth words. We want somebody to tell us how pretty we look, how great our dress look. That's a nice tie you got on, brother. I like your haircut. Man, I like the rims on that car. We flatter people. We say things that we don't mean. You know, now everybody should be nice to everybody. And you should always find nice things to say. But overly nice and things just to impress somebody for whatever the reason, because you want them to do something for you later, you want them to respond to you in a certain kind of way. You have to be very careful that your flattery don't turn into blanket, deliberate, intentional lies for reasons uh, that are not wholesome, or reasons that are not godly, or reasons that are not uh, uh, righteous. And we, who are the children of God, what we don't want is to get so caught up in the need for smooth words that we get accustomed to lies. We get accustomed to lies. For, you know, somebody to, to uh, we want people to say things that are not true about it. You got to know truth yourself. You know, you got to know truth yourself. Usually people want something from you when they flatter you. Somebody always patting you on the back, always telling you how great you are, always telling you, man, you, we, we can make it without you. You need to stop and check the situation out because they can make it without you. And you're not as great as they say you are, and you know you're not. You know, And you're not the only one who can bake a nice cake. But you, the problem is that if we're not careful, we get caught up in the flattery. They're lying, but we get caught up in the lie. And we start to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The scripture in the Bible talks about that very clear. Uh, we do it because we want recognition. I got the word reorganization, but the, the word is recognition. We want flattery because we want to be recognized. Everybody want to be somebody. That's true. I understand that. The Lord understands that. But don't let your need for, recreate, uh, for recognition destroy your truthfulness and your love for truth. Everybody want to be validated. Everybody. We in the church, we got people in the church, and I'm not just talking about Emmanuel, I'm talking about the church generally. They just want to be somebody. But don't let your need for validation destroy the truth that's got to emanate from you got to come from you. Everybody wants some kind of support. But when you finally get yourself in with the Lord, whether the people support you or not, when you know God is for you, David said, if God is for me, who can be against me? Everybody wants friendship and acceptance, but you don't want to pay that kind of price for it when you get caught up in living off of lies and deceptions and smooth words uh, and flattery to make you feel like you're somebody, uh, that only lasts for a very short period of time. 
Sometimes it don't last. Soon you get to the mirror and look at yourself, you can see what you really are. They tell me that the peacock, the, the male peacock, uh, the one who uh, struts around and, and he, uh, when he sees a female peacock, he flops out his wings and a display of beautiful colors, tremendous arrays. Sometimes it's just like, like a big old huge fan. Uh, because he's trying to attract the female, of course. But it also said, by those who study animals, especially birds and stuff, when he looks down at his feet, which they say his feet are the ugliest feet of any bird in the field, said his wings and everything just flop down immediately when he looks at his feet. Because when he looks at his feet, it comes back to his mind what he really is. He's not this glorious creature with an array of colors and feathers all over the place. He's just a plain old peacock with ugly feet. And that's what we need to do. We need to thank God, thank people for their comments of flattery, but we have to always keep the level head that if it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be nothing. I'm nothing. A hypocrite, hypocrisy is another form of lying. A hypocrite is a deceiver because he pretends to be something that he's not. He gives the impression that he's more righteous than he really is. Uh, that's a lie. That's, that's a lie. When you live a hypocritical life, when you are somebody that you're really not, there are people who actually change their identities and they become somebody else. Uh, sometimes they do it for criminal purposes. Like they don't rob the bank and so they got to go to another town and take on a, another persona, another name. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Uh, this is 2020. You almost can't get away with that kind of stuff no more. Not with all the being, A testing, and the fingerprinting, and the, uh, the computer stuff. They always find you now. But there's a lot of hypocrisy that goes on where people pretend to be what they're not. There are many, many people, even in our circles, you know, they want to be a great preacher. So what do they do? They get by the tapes of every great preacher they know and learn it verbatim, word for word, and then get up and preach it to us. Well, somebody in the audience remember, I heard that sermon before. They realized it didn't come from us, it came from somewhere else. I'm not saying you cannot preach sermons that you've heard from somebody else, but I'm saying the mindset, you don't want to get caught up in hypocrisy. You want to, you, you want to be real. You want to be who you are at all times. Because when you're not who you are, you're lying. When you're given the impression that you're more than what you are. The Lord said, when you come into the room and there's two seats there, you take the lower seat. Unless you're the head guy, take the lower seat so that you don't even get caught up in trying to be something that you're not. First Timothy 4 and 2 said, those who depart from the truth speak lies and hypocrisy and deceit. First Peter 2 and 1 said, Lay aside all gall. Gall means deceit. Don't live a life of pretense. There's nothing more miserable than trying to continually be somebody that you're not, because that means that you got to keep the persona up at all times. You got to, when you're that person, you got to keep it up. All right? Some think that they are innocent as long as they say what is technically true. Another form of lying is half truth but yet it involves deceit and hypocrisy. There's probably no such thing as a half-truth. Uh, I think if you lie, you just lie. But there's some people, if they don't tell the whole truth, I, and it might be somewhere akin to the sins of omission when you don't tell the whole thing, uh, when they just tell a part of it, and, and when people come back, say, well, I thought you said it, then you say, well, no, I didn't say it, or I didn't say it like that. Well, is it a lie, or is it the truth? That's the bottom line, you know. The Lord want us to be truthful at all times. He don't want us to lie to ourselves and he don't want us to lie to nobody else. He don't want us to tell no half truth, just tell the truth. Now, if you can't tell the truth, then I guess in the court of law, they say, I refuse to testify on grounds that I might incriminate myself. You know, maybe you need to say that, but at least you're not lying, okay? You're not lying. Then there's the cover-up lie. 
When people sin and commit other acts they want to hide from others, they often tell lies to cover it up. Uh, politicians always say the worst sin is not the act, but the cover up. And when they finally come to get you, what they get is what you don't cover it up rather than what you don't say. Almost any sin you can name will lead to lying to cover it up. Adultery, murder, stealing, whatever. You've got to find a way to cover it up. And the only, only, only thing that prevents a cover up is total repentance and total confession. Uh, that's why the, everything moves towards trying to take repentance out of the church and take confession out of the church. Because if you take those both out, then you can legally perpetrate a cover up. But when you con uh, completely repent and confess, there's no cover up. And then you can rightly tell uh, those who say your past sins, I see them, you can tell them is nailed to the cross because you have repented and you've covered up and the Lord has cast it into the sea of forgiveness. But he can't cast it into the sea of forgiveness if it's been covered up and not repented and not confessed. Or you end up like the five foolish who was in the church but really weren't in the church but didn't know they weren't in the church until it was time to go into the bride, the wedding. Then they recognize, I've been in the church, but I'm not in the church. First Corinthians 3, 18, let no man deceive you. Galatians 6 and 3, if any thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So two things, don't let nobody deceive you, but don't deceive yourself. Don't lie to yourself. Always be true. To thine own self be true. And I think the rest of that says, then you can be true to every man, but to thine own self be true. Now the thing about the Lord, because of his sovereignty, because of his omniscience, he knows all things. You cannot hide from God. That's what Ananias and Sapphira tried to do. They tried to hide. They come in, pull their purses out, say, this is all we got. And we're so happy to give it to the church. This is our part. And, the, and you know what happened? They fell dead. They dragged them out of there. They fell dead. Both of them fell dead for lying to God. We thank God this is the age where the Lord don't do that kind of thing, at least not on a regular basis that I'm aware of. But uh, when you lie and deceive yourself and receive others, deceive others, then you're in serious kind of trouble with the Lord. And not only are you in trouble with the Lord, but these kind of things keep you from growth and development and keep you from being what the Lord really wants you to be. Another form former lines, pride and envy. Often people tell lies because they want people to think that they're better than they really are. They lie to inflate their image. Uh, pride. Pride got a lot to do with lying. It's about got the inflating your image or enlarging your ego, making yourself bigger in life than you are. And people do it all the time. Uh, they do it all the time. Uh, and sometimes to our detriment, you know, we, we lie, we, we, we create lies, we, we go, and I always use a really simple example, we go buy a car that we know we can't afford because we're trying to give the impression that we can afford. And it works well until about the fifth, sixth month when the bank tell you to bring that car back. Then it comes to us and to everybody else that they have lied, they couldn't afford that car. Of course, you've seen people uh, that has happened to if you live long enough on the planet. You've seen that. People lie not to hurt other people. And th this is when it becomes a little touchy. You know, you, sometimes people, they, they honestly try not to hurt people. But you do more hurt and damage than you do help when you lie to them. Uh, that's why doctors, they come in, if you're sick, a doctor has been trained to say up front, sometimes they do it very coldly, sometimes they do it without any compassion, to say, you are sick, you only got six months to live, and then they walk out the room, there's nothing they can do. I worked as a therapist when I first started working in the counseling field, and one of the jobs I, I did for a while, I, would, I had to go to hospitals uh, to work with doctors, because doctors, 
they, they take courses in medical and that kind of thing, but I don't think they have a whole lot of training in psychology. So a doctor would come into the uh, operating room where I was, they would call me in, and after the doctor would tell the patient whatever they wanted to tell him, then I would have to be there in case the patient would get to crying and get to hollering or, or trying to get up out the bed and stuff, and I'm sitting there trying to calm them down because the doctor won't lie to him. He'd tell him right up front what's up, and then he walks out, and I'm sitting there trying to say, oh, it's going to be all right, Lord. I, I wouldn't say the Lord because I wasn't supposed to say that. It's going to be all right. You just take the medicine like the doctor said. Do you want me to call your people? You know, but people sometimes they lie to other people because they don't want to hurt them. Uh, they avoid problems just to save themselves. Consequences can be overwhelming when you lie. When you lie, the consequences can be overwhelming. Now, if the doctor goes in and lies to the patient, and, and like I said, I never had a situation where doctors lied. They just bluntly said, then it was me who had to try to, I, I won't say lie to him, but that's what they expected me to do, to try to tell him, don't worry, it's going to be okay. The doctor, he, he don't know what he's talking about. Well, I didn't do that job too long because it was just too much. It was overwhelming for me because uh, I knew that, I couldn't tell, the doctor said six months, and I couldn't go in and tell him, well, he lying, he don't know what he's talking about. Next slide, uh, Brother Kevin. I think we're almost there. Consequences lying. The harm that can come when people practice lying and deceit, they can't be trusted. Jeremiah 9, 4, and 5. Again, I use the, the example of Jacob, Jacob, Isaac, and Laban. Jacob, deceiver, Isaac, he deceived him. And Laban turned around and deceived Jacob. Uh, Jacob had lied so that he couldn't be trusted. The Lord eventually dealt with him, of course. Lying influences other people to sin. When you lie, if you're not careful, other people will lie because of the lie that you've told. And before you know it, a lie grows and grows and grows. Uh, when I was younger in the young people session, we used to play a game where we all line up, 10 of us, 15 of us, uh, and we would tell the first person whatever we wanted them to know. They had to tell the next person, and the next person tell the next person, all down the line until they got to the 15th person. And then at the end, we asked the 15th person what was told to you. And by the time it came out, it had been a big, by, by the time it got to them, the story had changed. So until you didn't even recognize what was originally told, that's how lies are. When you lie and the lie is not corrected or not taken care of, by the time it gets to the end, it has caused so much havoc. It has destroyed lives. It has destroyed people. It can destroy a church. It can destroy a home. It can mess up people's lives. That's why the Lord said, a liar will not tarry in my sight. I won't have it because you can't trust a liar. And then, there is a scripture the Bible says that the father of lies is Satan. He is the father of lies. He creates the whole lying thing to create chaos among the people, among the church, among families. He keeps them divided and separated from each other through a lie. You lie just right. You don't even have to take a gun and shoot nobody. You tell the right lie, and it's almost like they have shot themselves. Psalms 24, 3 and 5. Who, I think this might be my last scripture here. Who will stand in God's holy place? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart. We talked about that heart. Those who have not lifted up their souls to falsehood. That means have not lied and have not sworn deceitfully. This is the one who will be blessed by the Lord. Now, if you don't get anything else, get this, 24, three through five. Who's gonna stand in God's holy place? You that got those clean hands, and you who got that pure heart, and you have not lifted up your souls to lies, and you have not deceived, you're the ones who the Lord is really, really blessed. Lying is truly an abomination to the Lord. He hates a lying tongue. 
What about you and me? Do we hate lying tongues? Do we have lying tongues such as God hates? Or are we such as can stand before God holy because we have not accepted lies and deceit into our hearts and our lives? God is looking for us, out of us, truthfulness, righteousness, blamelessness for us to be the children of God that he wants us to be. Are right, the questions or comments here tonight? Yes, sir. Now, we know God cannot lie. How God do, can lie. How do what he said to Samuel when Saul had sinned and he sent to get David? And David was told him he was afraid to go because Saul would kill him. Mm -hmm. So the Lord told him, well, just tell him that he's going to offer sacrifice. Right. That's it. Okay. How, did that, how did that fit in? Uh, it, 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 you're saying, was that a lie? Okay, I don't think it was a lie because it the Lord not told been a lie, But I'm asking how do it fit in? You know, okay. God didn't lie. Okay. That... Well, I think it fit in that God can lie, and when he uh, when he finally said, "Tell them that you come to sacrifice," he just made it clear so that it would not appear that Samuel was lying. Because Samuel, I, if I can remember the story correctly, Samuel wanted to make sure. But Lord, if I go down there and I tell them that, they gonna know I didn't come down here just to make no sacrifice. But he said, you tell them that I sent you. So the Lord always makes an escape, if this helps, always makes an escape when there's a situation like that. Uh, and like some of the, the phrase out of here, I'm saying, you can simply say, well, I didn't mean it like that, or I didn't understand it like, there's always a way that you don't have to lie. You, you, you might not can't participate totally in the conversation, and I might be all over the place, but there's always a way. God will make an escape for you when you're trying your best to do right, be upright, be blameless, be holy. He will fix it, and he fixed it for Samuel because he told Samuel, he said, I can't do that. If I say that, they, they're going to know I'm lying. He said, but say this, that I, the Lord said, come to make sacrifice. Which he did. He wasn't no lie. He did come to make sacrifice. He he came to knowing a king, but he came to the sacrifice as well. This help a little bit, Dick and Henry. Yeah, sound like we're talking about a cover up. <laughs> That's what it sounds like to me. I mean, well, what you say a cover up was. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, the real I, I was what, was, what was the real reason he was going down there? What did the, Lord he, he, the real reason he was going so that he could anoint the king. That was the reason. But because he couldn't just do that without him putting his life in jeopardy, the Lord told him to say that while I'm there, I'm going to sacrifice. And that's what he, that's how he had got there. Now, this was the Lord who did this. I know that. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else? Okay. I got a question. I, 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 I got a question. question. Who's this? That's yes, me. Charlie. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about the scripture where I think it was Abraham went down with his wife and told the man. With his wife, Sarah. Scripture. Yeah. So he was deceiving and God allowed that deception. So is there a time when it's okay to. Is, is there a time when it's okay to lie? No, to deceive. To deceive. Well, I'm going to say, I'm going to use a lie in this, in the Stephen entertainment room. I, I don't think that it's okay at any time for you or me to deceive or lie. I do think that God sometimes in his infinite wisdom makes situations. And your Navy name. Okay, your you, I, I'm saying I think there are times in, in his infinite wisdom where he takes situations and he uses them 
uh, for an example, he uses them for certain outcomes. And I think he did that with this situation with Abraham and Sarah, because well, the Lord knew he didn't tell was Abraham to, to lie about that. Abraham did it on his own. <laughs> Y'all put me in a corner here tonight. Uh, <laughs> Y'all put me in a corner right? here tonight. Abraham did that on his own. Okay, but I think the, the bottom line know, was that know. the Lord, but, but did not the Lord know that if Abraham had a said, this is the, my uh, wife, that they would have probably took the girl from him. They might have would have killed him. Right, I mean, that's the reason the why he did, because she was so fair. Okay, it, it, and that's would have killed him and took her and probably, probably put her in the prostitution or something, you know, or at least made it part of somebody's errand. That's what they would have done. And so I believe, and we have to look at this, I got to come back on this one, that he had authority from God to no. say, hey, wait, let me finish, let me finish. Now, the other thing is this too, was not Sarah his sister? Well, yeah. Okay. Okay, I rest my case. Was not Sarah his sister? But it was some truth in it. But in order to, to deceive somebody and to lie, you have to know the truth. <laughs> to deceive. Uh, I don't know if you have to know the truth to deceive. I think it, it's because a lot of people operate on hearing what they think is the truth. We tell stories we don't know for sure. Ms. Loretta, I want you to answer that question when you get a chance. Was that what? his sister? Was that his sister? <laughs> That's uh, I'm saying. <laughs> somebody else, somebody else, help me real quick. I have a, I have a different question. I'll wait till y'all finish. Yeah, y'all go ahead. Okay. Uh, anybody got any more questions on Abraham and Sarah? I must have did a pretty good job. It was a sister. It okay. was a sister, but okay, it was also right. his wife. God didn't okay. tell him to lie. He did that. <laughs> but I don't know if he lied. I don't, he I he said he well, said it was my said, sister. She he said just deceived. didn't tell the whole story. He didn't tell the whole story. He said this is my sister, and it was his sister. But he did it with, to deceive, though. His intention wasn't to tell the truth. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me come back. Let me think through that a little bit, sister uh, Joanne. So the Bible said, speak things that are not as though they are. So if we're speaking something that isn't what it is right at that particular moment, is that lying? Oh, good question. Uh, it, it, I think at that point, it would be, it depends on the motive behind whatever it is that you were speaking at the moment. You know, if, if the motive and the intention is to hurt or to uh, take advantage of, then I think that would be wrong. But if you're talking out of inspiration or aspiration or you, things are going to get better, and I think that's a whole nother situation. So then would it be based on what you believe? Because well, if somebody tells me something and I believe what, what they it? tell me, or I believe that this is going to happen, and it doesn't, if I act on it, I'm acting on it because I believe it to be true. So if I try to deceive somebody with what I believe to be true, then I'm lying and, and deceiving. Well, not if what you believe is based in truth and reality. If you, if you know, if you, it's, if it's something that is based in the word of the Lord and there's some truth in it, even though it has not come to fruition, and it might not come to fruition, but in your mind, your your thoughts are pure. And, the, and they based in the word of the Lord, I don't see anything wrong with that. I wish for something that might not happen, but I wish it based upon the word of the Lord, what he said can possibly happen. He knows the contents of my heart. He knows I'm not doing anything maliciously. He knows I'm not doing something for my own gain. Uh, Pastor? Uh, yes, sir. I, I believe, uh, I, I, I believe uh, if if the deception is for the good, not a lie, but if if it's for the good, I believe that's that's uh, probably moves under the category of being wise. I don't know if you can just make all blanket deceptions. Uh, but that's my fear with your statement. I know what you're saying. I, I think fear. being wise. Good. Okay. Assuming that. Or for the 
so you're making, but you're making provisions for deception. Yeah, I'm saying you're right. I'm saying, uh, you know, all stuff like you, there's a godly pride. You know, there's a godly pride. Mm -hmm. you know, okay, all right. And maybe you know, we know God yeah. can't lie, mm -hmm. but He said that to uh, for him to go down there. Yes, uh, Abraham went down there. I mean, I mean, Samuel went down there to offer to offer sacrifice. That was his real reason. The real reason he's going out and anoint a king. Mm -hmm. I, I think the deception was not to take advantage. Mm. Well, I think uh, I, I'm still a little uh, the 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 permission to deceive is what got me. Uh, but at any rate, let let's do this. I don't want to hold us no longer here. Uh, I'm going to look at this deception thing a little more and uh, see what else I can come up with. But uh, what we do know is the Lord don't want us deliberately and intentionally lie. We all agree there. It's amen, church. Amen, amen. <laughs> we know he don't want that. But we'll look at that little, <laughs> we'll look at this a little more and, uh, and see what he had in mind when he uh, had some of this stuff to go about. Y'all have been really good tonight. I thank God for you. Thank God for uh, the lesson. Thank God for everybody that's online, all the different uh, homes that are represented here tonight. There is a Bible class, 12 o'clock on Wednesdays. If anybody like studying the word of the Lord, continuing to look at the word of God, uh, 12 o'clock, same uh, uh, Zoom address. And Sister Joanne uh, conducts that class and you more than willing to join it. All right? Well, I think that's everything. God bless y'all tonight. May the one last announcement. There will not be that deacon and trustee board meeting tomorrow because I gotta do some preparation. We'll do it next week. So get that word out if you can, deacon and trustee. May the Lord watch. May the Lord watch. Between me and the while uh, we're absent. Oh, one from another. One from another. One from another. In Jesus' name. Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. 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 God bless y'all. Praise the Lord. God bless y'all. Praise, 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 Praise the Lord. 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 Mm-hmm.